Hi everybody, my name is Marta Mama, I'm your basic queer bitch, and today we're going to be talking about Veneno episode 2. The second episode of Veneno was aired three months after the first episode, because the first episode was aired like March 2020, just when the pandemic was starting to happen and everything closed up, so they couldn't film, they couldn't do anything. It took three months for us to have the second episode, and then it took like four months for us to get the, four, the third episode. So this one was aired for Pride, and I think it's like a super sweet episode and an important one to have for Pride. It starts the first scene with Spanish music in a traditional paella that Paga is making. Like, this is, of course, you know, paella is this traditional like Spanish dish, and you know that Paca la Piraña was actually making a paella and that they all ate that after filming. It looks delicious. And then they start like explaining the tone for the whole episode and for the whole series. So this is how it's going to work. We have a veneno that's telling like her memories to Valeria who's writing the book. She's blowing up the story and then we have Paca who gives like the reality check to all of that. They start like mixing up the scenes because she's telling about how it worked in the Parque del Oeste. And you see like both scenes, both sets start merging and it looks like they're physically in El Parque del Oeste with their couches in Paca's house. And it's a very like interesting way because they're all setting the relation between reality and fiction and how it's all like intertwined and everything i just think it, it was a, like a very very smart choice from the beginning she suddenly like stops from all these voices all these memories and she says stop the story is mine and i'll be the one that tells it and then she starts talking telling her story she starts saying i was born this day blah 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 blah, blah. A little spoiler, <laughs> in, at the end of the whole series, like the last episode, the credits that they have at the end, instead of having a music for those credits, they literally have Veneno's real voice saying exactly that. It's so, so, so close and it's so on point, the accent and absolutely everything. And there is going to be a new way of jumping in time. We're going to have different timelines, but then we're going to explain how we're going to do it because it's very different of the way that we did it in episode one. That Veneno speaks and her voice like gets transformed into her younger self's voice. So she starts talking about Adra and then her voice transforms into Joselitos. So we have an introduction to her little village in Almeria, Adra. All the childhood scenes that we have are like very symbolic and are there for a reason. So we see the whole family dynamic. The actress that plays Joselito's mother is just spot on. It's crazy. One of the things that we're going to get to know through Joselito's childhood is the importance of beauty. And one of the first things that her sister t tells her is that they're looking at some pigeons and Joselito says, oh, but she's beautiful. And the sister says, the ones that are beautiful don't fly as high because you cannot have everything in life. And like that's like those little like traditional wisdoms that they give you. And we see that this relationship with her mother is something that is very like stuck for her psychologically. So we're like getting to see it's just hinting a little bit that talking about her mother is something that's difficult, that's problematic, and that is like very, very hurtful. That feeling about the mother and that like trauma is what like brings us again to 2006, to Baca's house. And Valeria starts having a lot of like trans women as friends in Baca's house. And you can really see that Valeria is like starting to glow, not because she's looking more femme, but she's like losing out she, the the look that she had in her eyes in college that's not there anymore. And suddenly, in all this euphoria, she just sees this friend from her mom or whatever. And this friend 
that knows Valeria's boy, she starts talking about her in like masculine. And this is a trans woman that hasn't even come out, but they make it like feel especially weird in that moment. We can really see that there is like an otherness and a problem and an element you have to like talk about even in very like supporting families. And you can really see that it's not only trans misogyny because she's hanging out with trans women, there is also like a class element, like if they look like they are prostitutes or if they look as like they're low class or there is a class element in that, in all that too. Even though Valeria, we know she had like a family that supported her a lot. You can really see this otherness and this being angry and she doesn't know what she's angry about and feeling like uncomfortable in her own house. And this whole situation is mirroring all this tension that is building up with Benina's story and her mom. After that, she's talking with this teacher about the book she wants to write. And this is another like very, very meta conversation because I'm sure that this is the Javis talking to themselves that they didn't know where to start. They, like there was like so much information, so many people talking about this, so many memories that they, they didn't really know like where to start. So it's a very like meta conversation that she's having. It's really Los Javis having the conversation with themselves. And I think that's very smart. And after having this conversation where she like sets out like the outline of her whole book, Valeria starts her transition. She runs to a bathroom and she starts taking the first day of hormones. And this is like a huge moment. And being in that mindset with attention home and just starting her transition without telling absolutely anyone. We have Veneno not looking her best in a Chinese restaurant where Amparo works. And they're just like having dinner and talking about the same exact stories Veneno tells again and again. And like the time she pooped in the eye of a client. You can really see that Valeria has already listened to all of these things. A funny thing about the Chinese restaurant is that uh, for Los Javis, when they were trying to convince Paca La Piraña to join in like the team as an actress and play herself, Paca La Piraña wasn't like very sure. She didn't un really understand what they were talking about. It was going to be a documentary. Is it was it going to be like a movie? So she didn't really understand. And Los Javis had to like travel down to Almeria where like, Paca La Piraña lived and they had like a lot of meals in the Chinese restaurant that Paca wanted to go while they explained everything to her. So I think it was funny that they included the Chinese restaurant just because of that. Let's start a difficult conversation. What happened in Adra? And then you know, just like deflects the question and you can really see that for Veneno, her childhood comes with a lot of trauma. And we have another transition when Veneno is narrator and then we continue with little Joselito's voice with the same word, with the word maricón. The word maricón is the F word for you guys. And it's a word that here in Spain has been reclaimed by the community. So it's very normal for like queer people, especially gay men, to call that to each other. And she says something that's super, super powerful, that once she understood that her mother never went, was going to love her, she didn't care if the whole town just hated her. That was like super powerful. And she starts telling her story of her growing up in Adra. And then Amparo comes and interrupts the whole scene. This represents obviously the allies of the community. What you're saying is correct. Everything you're saying is amazing, but Many times it's better just to listen to the people you have to listen instead of just like saying things that everyone knows. And I think the only reason why they had this interruption is just because of that, to make you like feel uncomfortable, to say, Amparo, shut up, just let her talk. I think that was genius. That's my favorite scene from the whole, not true, but one of my favorite scenes from the whole episode is Amparo interrupting. I love it. Benino starts telling her story from her childhood and she like you can see that her queer identity was something that was very joyful and she enjoyed herself very much 
growing up in her queerness, we have this 60s song that the lyrics for that song is like, it's terrible actually, but it sounds like something like fun and whimsical and very 60s. So you can really see this queer child dressing up with her mom's clothes and wearing her mom's makeup and being like all cute with the same song. He like gets severely abused by his mother and they do it with that happy song because they don't want this one element to be especially traumatic. They're treating this abuse as something that is normal. So they don't cut that music in the whole time. It's still very happy and upbeat and you see really severe physical abuse happening in that house. We get introduced to Manolito, that's Joselito's best friend, and you can really see like the queer childhoods and their conversations. There is a queer element involved in like everything that's super traditional and folk in Andalusia. Like it's something that queer people in those times, drama and the performance that comes with a lot of like folk and traditional things, your people gravitate towards. We also get introduced into Gracia Sevillana, who was a neighbor from Adra, who was like her mom that wasn't her mom, the one that fed her and took care of her growing up. And coming back to the to what beauty was for Cristina growing up, they're talking about the peacocks and they say that peacocks use their tails to like attract partners, but also as protection. And that's like very interesting. Then we have the first communion scene that was one of the best things in the whole series. We have like a more like rock, rockabilly, punk rock from the 70s song that's called Echemos Abajo La Estación de Tren, like let's blow up the train station and they only repeat that all the time. So it's something that's very like trans transgressive and very like punk. And Joselito comes out with his first communion dress that he custom made to have like short skirt and look all like beautiful and gorgeous and living her fantasy. There's like a very sexually weird moment in the first communion with Joselito with her mouth open and looking like in a very defiant way to her mom. And then she transforms into a beautiful, beautiful peacock. It's so symbolic. It's so Garcia Marquez or all these like writers that would mix like fiction with reality. And it's always like very, very symbolic and the way Manolito is the only one like rooting for her. And I think it's a beautiful scene. It's what, these are the scenes you cry with when you're watching Arenino, the beautiful ones, the like transgressive ones. And I just love, love, love that scene very much. The way they take us back to 2006 is through food, like comfort food. And they're introducing this element that Cristina always had problems with her weight, like after coming out of jail, she was constantly on a diet and what food means for her in terms of like comfort. Everyone in the restaurant is just looking at her and listening at her. The people that are listening in the restaurant just represent us all, just listening to the story. We're like, <gasps> you can really see her having, see Veneno having a breakdown when they come back and she had, she's like really drunk and she's taking pills as well. So she couldn't and she shouldn't be drinking. And she asks for a telephone when she comes back and Pacata like takes care of it. And Valeria suddenly like realizes that what, then Inno wants us to call her mom. Like after all these years and after all this, she only wants to talk to her mom and hear her mom say that she loves her. Mirroring this, we have Valeria's relation with her mother and she starts confronting her mother, feeling very uncomfortable around her mother. Like, how would you feel about your transness? How would you feel about your queerness? if like all the queer stories that you're listening to are like so, so, so devastating. Then we got introduced into Joselito, like young Joselito, and you can really see this cult queer culture from Andalucía. They, like Manolito and Joselito, they talk like old ladies and it's very, very funny, charming. 
the look that they have for the fair, the look that Joselito has, they say that it's a Miguel Bosé look, but that was just Manolito just guessing. It's really a look from Miguel Molina, who was a queer icon in Spain, and it's like a very important person, and it he was like a singer and a dancer. We already have a lot of like references of queer people in the traditional, traditional Andalusian culture. It's like, I don't know, imagine that all the country stars and everything was fascinating for queer people, something like that. You can see like the sexual awakening for them too. And you can see this like terrible abuse that they suffered at the fair. And the thing, the worst thing about it is not only like the fear or the frustration it leaves you feeling. The worst thing it, of all is when Manolito played by Omar Banana says, I really thought I liked him and that breaks your heart in 100,000 pieces. That's the terrible part. Um, Valeria is listening to all this and how is she feeling about herself? Like, and after all this violence with other teenagers from Madra, um, she comes back home and she gets the same abuse or worse from her mother. It really makes you feel terrible when you're listening to it because you know that was like true and still happens and it's terrible and it's making Valeria feel a certain way. The, then we have like a very, very sweet scene where Veneno, old Veneno in 2006, is trying to call um, Gracia La Sevillana, her neighbor, the one that saved her life on many occasions. She tries to call her now that like she should be old. She talks with the daughter and the daughter tells Veneno that sadly Gracia passed away some years ago and it's a very like terrible scene where she's crying and it feels like so so sad but they introduced this one element to make it all feel lighter and the phone that she's using is shaped as a banana and I think that's just genius every time we have something like very traumatic there, it's like covered with something that's kind of ridiculous and something, you know, and everything, every time we have something epic, there's something ridiculous and humorous. So they're trying to like play a little bit with their emotions. They're like pulling and letting go a little bit. They're continuing mirroring this like Joselito and Maleria. And then we have some two beautiful scenes of both Joselito and Valeria like setting themselves free. And that's when Valeria talks with her mom and she, ex she gives this like beautiful speech. She talks like, we are the women who blah, blah, blah. And it's a beautiful way to come out and it's a beautiful speech. And on the other hand, Joselito is in Adra and she runs away with her sister, uh, who was also abused by the mother because she was queer. So they just run away, and before running away, they stop at the neighbor's house and they free all the birds that he had in cages. So it's like the perfect mirroring image of Joselito setting free and escaping the abuse and uh, Maleria coming out to her mom. And we also have like these two queer people and it's very important that they mirror this way in that Valeria is a happy story because if they were only telling us Veneno's story, it would be devastating. It, we couldn't handle. I don't know how I would feel with my queerness if I only got Veneno's story. But having the one from Valeria mirroring this one, having a supporting family and having a happy ending, I think it's just genius. It's the only way that you can give hope to Veneno's story, who's already a closed story because she passed away. So the only way that we can introduce ourselves in that conversation is having like a new generation of queer people that grew up with the support of their parents and the love of the parents. You can also see that even if your parents support you 100%, there's always like this tension before coming out that comes from like an otherness and like 
not being able to like explain ourselves perfectly fine like all queer people have in common like that trauma of the otherness but depending on the support that you have from people around you, you can make something of it or not. I hope you liked this episode. This is a beautiful episode. The scene of little Joselito dressing up with his mom's clothes with a song and then being severely abused by his mom is beautiful. The scene at the church having the first communion is beautiful. But my favorite scene is when Amparo interrupts Benino's conversation because that is not beautiful, but is very, very, very telling. And I think that was gorgeous. So thank you very, very much for watching. I'm trying to make the videos a little bit shorter so I don't bore absolutely everyone. So if I left anything out, please comment below and ask me. I would love to like answer. Thank you very much for coming with me in this journey of watching Veneno, of re-watching Veneno. I hope you guys are liking it just as much as I am. You can follow me on my Twitter. I'm going to leave my personal Instagram down below and I'm also going to leave my PayPal. I'm very sorry I cannot make videos as often as I would like to, but remember I'm a single mom and I have to like work. So I really, really appreciate the people that have sent me PayPals. I want to thank Marian, I want to thank Rita and I want to thank Jose Ignacio. Thank you guys very much because this is very difficult. <laughs> so I want you guys to tell me what your favorite scene from this episode was and how you're liking this. Let me know if you're liking this or not. See you next time. Stay queer.